good to join us this morning. Uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, and so the Sunday in which we traditionally uh, celebrate the Sacrament of Communion. I want to make sure that everyone knows that everyone is uh, welcome to receive the uh, elements of the bread and the cup. Uh, the way that we'll do it this morning is have everyone come to the center aisle and then come forward. I'll be standing up here with a tray of uh, bread. You can take bread, and then um, two of our council members will be here on the sides, uh, and you can take a, a cup of juice from their communion tray. Um, and then return to your seats um, uh, through the side aisles. Um, we also are going to be uh, welcoming two new members, and uh, so uh, we're glad to uh, welcome uh, Wesley and uh, Megan uh, into our membership this morning, and uh, have a message for you as well, a sermon. Uh, Kai, thank you so much for being our, our musical leader this morning. Um, you are going to really enjoy uh, the pieces that uh, Kai has prepared for us this morning. And thanks to Phil for being our uh, worship leader. Very glad uh, that he could be here and uh, help lead uh, the worship service this morning. Um, if you look at the bulletin, there are a number of uh, announcements. Uh, one of which I want to just make sure that everybody knows uh, is that uh, two weeks from today, on May 21st, we are having a, uh, our spring congregational meeting. And uh, this is a traditional uh, meeting that we have, um, and usually every year the, the idea is that we're going to accept annual reports as well as vote on a new slate of officers and team leaders for the council. Uh, but this year is a little bit different in that we are also going to be voting, hopefully to approve, a, a major building campaign. Um, many of you are aware that uh, our property team has been talking about the need to address the windows uh, around the church. And uh, the most, um, uh, the, the highest priority windows that are in need of the work the most are the windows that are right here around us in the sanctuary. Um, and uh, so I please ask you to uh, read through uh, the information that uh, came out in our May newsletter. Um, but uh, we are going to be voting on, hope, again, hopefully going forward with a $32,000 uh, project that will help uh, to make sure that these windows are in great shape for another, hopefully, 25, 30 years. Um, and uh, so, that, so that nobody here has to worry about it, right? It can be the next generation's uh, concern. Uh, we pass the building on uh, to the next generation of uh, folks who are worshiping here. Um, also want to uh, make sure that folks know that the, on the 21st, that's going to be a really special worship service because we're going to have the kids' choir, uh, the chancel choir, and the bell choir all playing uh, during that worship service. And my, I can give you a preview of my sermon. That'll be my sermon on the 21st. Uh, so the idea is that we can get done with the service uh, by about 10.45 get into our spring congregational meeting, and then go downstairs for a luncheon to celebrate the end of the program season. Um, so we do hope that everybody will be here for the service and for the meeting and then for the fellowship following. Um, church School is also doing a little project. They are hoping to uh, refresh the bags um, which we have available for children who come to worship. Um, there are uh, little bags that have like uh, crayons and markers and pencils and uh, coloring books and things like that. And so the church school is um, collecting new or gently used items like that that could be put into a uh, bag for the kids who come to worship to uh, you know, give them something to do while they're listening carefully to the pastor's sermon during those worship services. Uh, yeah. Anyways. Um, also, I want to draw your attention to the back of the bulletin. Uh, uh, we've had this uh, last week and have it again this week, the uh, daily examen. Um, this is a process of prayer. Um, if you've ever thought, like, I'm not sure what to pray about or how to pray, uh, this is a really nice outline of a, uh, a method of prayer that goes back well over 500 years in the history of the church. And uh, it's one that uh, uh, we, as a, as a church, are kind of learning in order to do a little bit further down the line, but to do some discernment work about our ministry as a congregation. And so I want to invite the individuals in the church to, uh, to you know, kind of become familiar with this way of praying. And uh, I encourage you to, uh, to, to do it on a daily basis if you are able. And uh, uh, we've really found it helpful. And uh, so I just want to encourage folks to take a look at that. 
Um, I think that's all I have right now. Um, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, let us uh, continue our worship with our uh, piano intro. <laughs>
as we share the opening prayer. Creator, you have made us in love and us in grace. with our friends and neighbors gathered here this morning. Friends in Christ, we all are received into the church through the sacrament of baptism. At this time, we are going to call forward uh, two individuals who have found nurture and support in the midst of the family of Christ. Through prayer and study, they have been led by the Spirit to affirm their baptism and to claim in our presence their covenantal relationship with Christ and the members of this church. They are here for service to Jesus Christ, using the gifts which the Holy Spirit has given to them. This time I'd like to invite uh, Wesley and Megan and Mangershine to please come forward. Wesley, Megan, you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are equally citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus alone being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in Christ, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Uh, the questions that we ask. Uh, at this time are an affirmation of faith, uh, and they are an affirmation of the same vows um, that Megan Wesley, um, uh, their eldest son, Raymond, um, was baptized by Jeff, right? So that was one of, I think that was Jeff's last baptism that he did was for uh, their son, Raymond. Um, and when Raymond was baptized, uh, Megan and Wesley were asked these questions um, on behalf of the child that they were being baptized. And so whenever somebody joins the church, uh, we ask them to reaffirm these baptismal vows. And so uh, the first part of the questions are just the affirmation of baptismal vows. And so I ask you, uh, Wes and Megan, do you desire to affirm your baptism into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I do. Do you renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, please say, I do. Do you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, please say, I do. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the ways of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness the work and word of Jesus Christ as best you are able? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. Do you promise according to the grace given you to grow in the Christian faith, to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world. If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. The next questions, um, one is our church covenant. So we're asking uh, Wesley and Megan to affirm the covenant uh, that we've all, uh, uh, as, which is a part of our church constitution. And then also uh, it is a question about their participation in the life of the congregation. So first, the church covenant. Depending upon the teachings and life of Jesus for inspiration and guidance, will you promise to seek to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. And then the question about participating in the church. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local church as it serves the community and the world? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. I promise with the help of God. Uh, we are a covenant-making congregation, and so 
uh, Wes and Megan have made promises to the church, and now it is time for us to make promises to them. So I invite you now to stand and to please turn in your, or those who are able, please stand. Um, and on page 46 in the New Century Hymnal, you'll see uh, a little uh, uh, thing that talks about the welcome and reception. So it's in the first part of the hymnal. Everybody got it? So let us, the members of First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Fort Washington, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry. Let's share together. We welcome you with joy in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love and be witnesses of our risen Savior. Let's be in prayer together. O oh God, we praise you for calling us to faith we give you thanks for gathering us into the church, the body of Christ. We thank you, God, for your people gathered together here and rejoice that you have increased our community of faith. Together, may we all live in spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the life and worship of the church, and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On behalf of the congregation, Wes, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to you both. And we're so glad to uh, have your kids, uh, Raymond and Cora, with us. And uh, um, here's to a great uh, future together. So let's welcome uh, Raymond and of the Apostles, chapter 7, verses 55 through 60. It can be found on page 126 of the New Testament in the Pew Bible. Stephen is the first martyr killed for, for proclaiming his faith in Christ. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. If you'd like to read along, it can be found on page 108, of the New Testament in the Pew Bible. Jesus is speaking words of comfort to his disciples as he prepares them for his path to the cross. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may, also, may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, 
you will know my father also. For now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it.
Uh, let's be together in prayer. Gracious, loving God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of the Scripture shared with us this day. We pray, God, that we might use this holy text as a lens through which to see the world around us, a lens through which to see even our own lives. Help us to view the world through your eyes, God. Help us to see clearly the path before us. Help us to see truly the way and the truth and the life. Help us to be your disciples, God, this day and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The uh, text from, from uh, Acts is, uh, is a remarkable um, little turning point in the history of the church. Um, it's remarkable because it is after um, Stephen's martyrdom uh, that the church begins to spread because they're, again, kind of scattered. This, uh, this, is, a, this is a shattering event in which uh, Stephen is killed for his proclamation, the first martyr. And uh, the church uh, is, 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 you know, damaged by this event. Uh, this is terrible, but at the same time, it is uh, out of Stephen's um, proclamation uh, that begins almost to be a, a fuel for the spiritual fire that is lit beneath the church. Um, it is a turning point because the church has been um, successful. The church has been very successful. Uh, Peter's sermon um, uh, it talks about the life of Jesus and what Jesus came to bring, and 5,000 people are converted and become followers of Jesus. Um, Stephen preaches a sermon um, which is rather judgmental and is rather um, condemning of the Jewish people for what they have done uh, to, to, to the one they believe, that the Christians at least believe is the Messiah. And uh, it is not well received. And uh, Stephen is martyred. Um, it is a very difficult thing for the church to understand a uh, proclamation of love, a proclamation of uh, uh, lifting up the oppressed, a uh, proclamation of forgiveness, uh, God's love and grace poured out upon the whole world. Uh, how could that be received so negatively? How could that be received with so much rage and violence? And one of the questions we have uh, before us is, is, what is Peter's or what does uh, Stephen's martyrdom have to do with, with us? I mean, we as Christians in the world that we live in, and the society and the culture that has been built around us and that we have helped to build ourselves, uh, we're fairly comfortable as Christians. Um, uh, we live in a society that gives tax breaks to churches. Uh, we live in a church that, uh, in a society that gives tax breaks even to clergy. Um, I'm in a special tax classification, which some of my salary uh, isn't taxed for income tax purposes. That's a special favor uh, that our culture has given to churches and to uh, uh, religious leaders that is not present necessarily in other places. Um, we live in a, in, in, a, in a culture that has, you know, lifted up predominantly uh, Christian leaders. Um, predominantly Protestant Christian leaders. There's been kind of a, an assumption that uh, the, the Protestant version of Christianity will be something that all of us uh, uh, can agree on and, and live out our lives in comfort. So what do we do with a text in which somebody for whom this proclamation, the same proclamation, becomes something that ends their life? that gets people so upset, so critical, so enraged um, that they seek to end his life. Um, I want to share with you um, a reading. This is something I came across this week, and uh, with Bruce's uh, service yesterday, I didn't get a chance to necessarily like, 
uh, memorize it. So I wanted to lift up with you. Uh, Timothy Hare is a, uh, a Methodist pastor out in uh, Connecticut. Uh, and he wrote this reflection uh, talking about um, the martyrdom of Stephen and how we as 21st century Christians might kind of take that into our understanding of our faith. And so uh, Timothy writes, the issue of martyrdom may feel irrelevant to many of the folks in the pews on a Sunday morning. Though Christians do still die for their faith all around the world, many of our folks will never encounter such a threat. Nevertheless, Stephen's story remains worthy of a listen. Stephen's story may prove helpful in <coughs> guiding Christians to consider the ways in which faithfulness to God may sometimes clash with the common assumptions and practices of modern culture. Timothy writes, for example, what does our Christian faith have to say about rampant consumerism and our complicity in it? What does Christianity and our Christian faith have to say about our nationalistic impulses and the self-interest that guides the foreign policy of our nation as well as many other nations. What does our Christianity, what does our faith have to say about environmental stewardship and our current patterns of living? Though many of us may never be asked to die for our faith, our faith still calls us to measure our priorities, to take a stand, and to express our beliefs through action. For those of us in this position, Stephen's story is still very much a relevant model of faithfulness and obedience. I think oftentimes we're led to believe that our Christian values will just, you know, be the same as the values of the world around us and the culture we live in. Um, that our values are shared uh, by the rest of the world. But that is not necessarily the way it is. Um, our church is an open and affirming church. Way back in 2010, the church unanimously voted on becoming an open and affirming church. So I can say to our church members, what does our faith say about laws that seek to silence transgender people? What does our Christianity have to say about those who would limit even mentioning sexual identity? There's a place for Stephen's story in asking us to also make a stand for our faith. We are a church that believes all people are made in the image of God. So what does our faith say about institutional racism? What does our Christianity have to offer when we talk about ongoing injustice towards people of African descent? It may seem a long way from Stephen's martyrdom to the church of comfort and a church of the establishment of which we are a part. But when we begin to look at the ways that our faith pushes us, our faith calls us to look at the world a little bit differently, that our faith invites us to make a stand and to proclaim loudly, to proclaim with strength and conviction and with courage that we have something important to say about God's love, about God's forgiveness, about God's grace, and that even today, even today, 
something as simple as talking about God's love for everyone, about God's grace that comes to us, that God accepts us and that we only need to accept that grace. Even this proclamation today can get us in trouble. We come to the table today to find the strength, to find the, 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 the nurture, the spiritual nurture that will encourage us, that will encourage us to stand strong in the midst of, of other voices and other um, understandings, other uh, uh, voices that would seek to silence and marginalize. We come to take into ourselves the very body and blood of Christ, that we may follow in Jesus' footsteps, that we might follow in the footsteps of the martyrs, even. We're not being called to give up our lives. We may just be called to be just a little uncomfortable sometimes. But that is a strength. Amen. Let's uh, share together. Um, it's number 322. It's in the red hymnal. Uh, it is in remembrance. 322, the red one.
for those communities of support, our clubs, our church, the different organizations in which we find camaraderie, in which we find fellowship, in which we find support and encouragement. We thank you, God, for the gift of faith, for the trust that we have that you are with us. We thank you, God, for being present to us in every moment. We know that we're not always the disciples that you've called us to be. Times when we become so focused in on ourselves and our own problems, we forget about those around us. Times when we become so dismayed, so disappointed, so filled with grief and sadness that we forget how blessed, how gifted we are. But God, your love for us exceeds anything that we can imagine. Your grace is larger than we can comprehend. And so we know that you love us. We know that you accept us exactly as we are. Gracious God, we lift to you all of the graduates in this season as the school year comes to a close. We give you thanks for the supports, the families, the institutions, the groups that have gathered together to celebrate great achievement. We thank you for the people who are part of our church who work so diligently behind the scenes making sure that things work and improvements are made. We thank you, God, for organizations like Adoption Choice and for the work that they do to help children and families find one another. We lift up Megan's grandmother, Linda. We pray for her and her recovery from a broken hip. We pray that she might have the strength and the patience the perseverance to get through the recovery. Pray for Jennifer's father, Irv. So glad that he's recovered from his health crisis, even as he knows he's got a difficult path ahead. Got all of these concerns and joys, all of these and so many more, we lift to you. Hear us as we open our hearts and minds to you in the silence of our sanctuary. Hear us as we lift our own joys and concerns in silence. Loving God, thank you for hearing our prayers. Whenever we turn towards you, God, we find that you are already turned towards us. We trust that you've heard our prayers. We trust that you'll answer them according to your will and in your time. But hear us now as we lift the prayer that Jesus has taught his disciples to pray and so has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our ushers will receive.
receive the morning's offering, let each of us give as we are able to pray the blessings which God has already given to us.
Gracious and loving God, we pray that you would consecrate by your Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine. Bless us that as we receive them at this table, we may offer you our faith and our praise. We pray that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and that we may continue faithfully in all things. Amen. It is through the broken bread that we participate in the body of Christ. It is through the cup of blessing that we participate in the new life that Christ has to offer to each of us. At this time, I invite our council members, Ken, Kathy, to come forward uh, with the trays and uh, then I'll invite everyone to come forward.
your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. May the grace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.